Hello, my name is Minu V. I am Assistant Professor of English at Government Arts and Science College, Kulatur in Kerala. And uh, today I am delighted to talk to you about the ecological repercussions of fast fashion. Um, before I go into my presentation, I would like to appreciate and thank the Department of English, APC Mahalakshmi College for Women, uh, for organizing this international conference on, on eco-ethics, ethics in English uh, literature. And uh, I would specifically like to thank uh, Dr. P. Balashan Mukhadevi and uh, Ms. K.S. Anushya for uh, contacting me in person and uh, inviting me uh, to be a part of this conference. Also, although I would have loved to travel to your institution uh, under the dire circumstances, this is what we have to do. And in future, I would like to collaborate with your institution. So thank you so much for the invite. So let's move on to my presentation, which is the uh, ecological repercussions of fast fashion. So the reason I chose this topic is because fashion is very uh, related to our life, actually. And it's very close to almost all of us. We present ourselves in the way we dress, uh, the makeup, and every attribute of our exterior self, exterior self. So it is actually a model of self-expression. Now, it's also, it also becomes a part of cultural creation at times. So sometimes a trend uh, work together and it's picked up by the masses and it translates into fashion. So the, the whole community in a geographical area uh, of a particular age and time, they represent themselves in a particular way. So in that sense, it translates into the cultural creation too. That's why Virginia Woolf in Orlando says that vain trifles as they are, Clothes change our view of the world and the world's view of us. So when we meet a new person, the first thing we uh, look at and judge them by is what they are wearing and how they appear before us. And in India, fashion industry has found a great flourishing ground because it has to cater for millions of people. And thus it has entered into the scope of Indian cultural production as well. So we, all, we know that uh, in certain professions, we prefer certain kinds of clothing. Like for teachers, uh, sari is actually um, considered to be very respected, although I'm not wearing one at the moment. Uh, anyway, before I go into my presentation, I would like to tell you about different types of uh, clothing brands. There, there are high-end clothing brands, and there are more affordable kind of uh, clothing brands too. Uh, High-end clothing brands, some examples are given here in the presentation, Paul Smith, Armani, Versace, Dior, etc. And we know about some high-end uh, fashion designers in India like Masaba Gupta, Manish Malhotra, Sabya Saji, etc. Um, for example, if you look at the uh, sari on the right side of the slide, you can see that it's a very peculiar looking sari, very popular design with Tamil print. It was designed by Masaba Gupta. Although it was very expensive, it couldn't be afforded by any of us. But still it picked up because it was made affordable to us by fast fashion, which is what I'm going to talk about. Excuse me. Okay, sorry. Now about fashion culture in India. India has a very unique custom of handing down clothes and accessories like jewelries over the generation. Um, but, you know, Everybody in the audience, we have that experience. We have used our mothers or aunts or sisters, clothes or accessories at some point of time in our life. But with the development of affordable fashion brands like Fab India, W, Biba, uh, Westside, Aurelia, and there are some shopping centers like Brand Factory, Reliance Trends, etc. This uh, um, fashionable, trendy clothing was made available to us at a very low price. And it led to an attitude of disdain and neglect for hand-me-down culture. So it has actually kind of messed up, like we don't feel like using our mother's old clothes now because it's not, you know, we have to have our own new, brand new clothes. So I would like to introduce this particular uh, term, fast fashion, to you. Now what is fast fashion? Fast fashion is actually a way of making clothes quick, cheap and disposable. Clothing items, we, uh, the fast fashion brands are constantly on the lookout for new fashion uh, trends and all. So they go to all these uh, fashion weeks and uh, catwalks and ram shows and all in cities like New York and Paris and all. And 
once they see a new design they copy it and bam it is available two weeks later in their uh, showrooms uh, some international fashion uh, fast fashion brands are h&m zara fashion nova victoria secrets etc and in india we have some fashion brands like peter england alan soli monte carlo and everybody knows good old max which is very affordable anyway and very keeps us very stylish and fashionable and uh, second Okay, so why is fast fashion so popular? There are a couple of reasons why. First of all, consumerism. So the patterns of consumption have grown by leaps and bounds over the past few decades. I have to quote uh, Dillis Williams, the director of the Center for Sustainable Fashion, College of London. She says that the expectation is to keep up with the ever-changing trends to respond to the constant noise that says, come, buy something else. So you see this creepy looking person, I don't even know if it's a woman or a man. Uh, the person is holding a placard saying, buy more stuff. That's what we are at now. Uh, nothing is enough for us. We need to buy more. We need to become the god of all these things. So social media also plays a considerable role in increasing fashion consumption. I'll come to that later. Now, following consumerism, I have to quote this uh, particular philosopher named Penti Linkola. He contrasts between desire and necessity. Now, at desire, we have a lot of desires. And it is because we have limitless imagination. We imagine that we could be much more than what we are at the moment. We need more. We, we need more stuff. We need more... Uh, things like, you know, material things and all. So, anyway... Whenever we have desire, it always violates the rules of ecology. And he says that if we imagine life as a spectrum, on one side of the spectrum, you can place desire, language and imagination. And on the opposing side, you can place the roles, laws of ecology. And if you lean towards one, you will be compromising on the other. Like that is if you lean more towards your desire, like I want a lot of clothes. I want trendy clothes every day. So I am compromising. I am violating the rules of nature. And I will be telling you how we are violating. We all feel like it's just clothes. I use only cotton. How am I violating the rules of ecology uh, by doing that? So he also equates uh, the desire side as choosing death, the ecology side as choosing life. So if you can notice, uh, there are two pictures uh, on the screen. The first one is a picture of a city, the city, uh, it's Los Angeles actually. And the other one is a very um, lovely picture of a natural setting. We don't know where that is, very idyllic anyway. So anyway, if you compromise, if, if you choose to live in a city, you'll have to compromise on the values of being uh, amidst nature and vice versa too. So anyway, I have to also, I also recall uh, something I read in Objective Psychology by Freud. He says that the inner self is also divided into two poles. The pole of self and the pole of the other. If you lean towards the pole of self, like you're very selfish, you're only concerned about yourself. You don't care about the other. The other means a society. And if you lean further towards the pole of self, what happens is we become completely detached from the other. We don't know about the social patterns of behavior. We could even fall into um, clinical uh, problems like schizophrenia, you know. So um, again, let, let's take a look at consumption patterns. Earlier in the fashion industry, there were four main seasons, four primary seasons. And uh, a design team would work on new products over uh, 12 to 8 months before the merchandise reaches the racks in the shops. In the fast fashion models, the new merchandise is continuously flowing into the stores more often. Now, retailers actually speak about having 52 micro seasons now. We have 52 weeks in a year. Now, there are 52 um, micro seasons of fast fashion in the industry. It is really bad because new supplies of tribute come every Monday, Friday, uh, Wednesday, I don't know, some four days in a week, every um, new shipment of cloth comes to the, clothes come to the uh, racks. Anyway. So that the products uh, hang on the rack, hang in the rack only for six to 12 weeks, ideally. 
and uh, most brands came to uh, claim to go from design to rack only in two weeks i already mentioned that before fast fashion brands rely on high sales volume and this is mostly successful because it's cheap everybody comes and buys that anyway so that's about consumption patterns um, the second reason why fast fashion is very popular is because the lack of ecological awareness we don't know how much it is affecting the ecology how much it is destroying the planet so fashion industry is said to be the second largest polluter in the world second only to oil first we have to deal with oil use in fashion fashion industry during production we use a lot of oil and fossil fuels during transportation disposal recycling phases in all these phases we are using up a lot of oil i have to mention something about peak oil crisis here now we have a good quality of life now we are resting assured that everything will be good even in future it's because the comfort and ease of life that we have now we got it from uh, the oil resources the fossil fuels for everything in our life we are dependent on fossil fuels but one thing we don't realize is that the quantity and quality of the remaining oil resources in the world has diminished and it will continue to do so and one day we are heavily especially in india we are dependent on the uh, on the oil resources in the gulf region and once it's used up there will be a complete drain of non renewable oil resources and the life after this will be drastically altered now this crisis is called peak oil crisis and thinking about clothing we can say that uh, a large amount of clothing items exist and they, it is also wasted it is related to uh, the large number of population in the planet we have to clothe 7 billion people in this planet and the population boom in itself there was no uh, not this much population uh, in the past it was caused because we uh, there was a boom in petroleum resources and life was made easy um, because of petroleum resources you know we have better transportation better facilities and uh, mortality rate has uh, reduced so in turn this population actually needs and consumes petroleum resources by and large to survive it's not actually about survival it is actually for betterment of life we are exploiting uh, oil resources anyway so these are the two reasons in uh, consumerism and uh, lack of ecological awareness why fast fashion is very popular i have to introduce the theory of memeology uh, to you guys uh, by uh, chad haig uh, my husband um, i'd like to introduce this book to you uh, this uh, Chad Haig's first book. It is a critique of transcendental memeology, a peak oil philosophy of truth. Anybody who likes to, who would like to have a, a, a preliminary understanding of memeology and peak oil crisis, I recommend to read this book. It is available on Amazon. So he has graphically represented the change of civilization, our civilization into um, four different phases that actually six phases I'm only mentioning four at the moment at the out in the outset we had a phase called the hunter-gatherer phase uh, we hadn't uh, domesticated or dominated nature yet uh, we just consume whatever was around us whenever we felt hungry so the nature uh, wasn't yet dominate if you can look at my cursor you see the straight line this is a graphical representation of hunter gatherer second phase is the agrarian phase agrarian phase is where, where, where nature became dominated you see this circle so everything was happening in cycles so that is gra uh, graphically represented using a cycle here so the farming occurs in cycles um, and then uh, animal husbandry also in cycles a calf is born and he bec uh, she becomes uh, an adult and uh, gives milk and then another calf is born through her you know everything happens in cycles so this is the second phase the third phase was the phase of infinite progress infinite progress was in this phase was uh, we completely started utilizing the fossil fuel uh, resources so a belief in infinite progress of the world was characteristic of this phase so there was increased production, increased consumption, increased wastage in this particular 
uh, face if you can see this arrow pointing upward this is a graphical representation of infinite progress these pictures are uh, graphical representations he calls it memes actually uh, anyway there was a yearning for better than of products we wanted everything better we wanted um, new resources and uh, new technology and everything and we had this belief that whatever happens life is just headed up for example in 1970s everybody was talking that in by the year 2020 we would be having flying cars and we'd have, be building houses in the moon and all so what is happening now is we are teaching each other to properly wash hands because of the coronavirus anyway so anyway let's move on to the fourth phase the bell curve if you can look at this this is the year of salvage and John Michael Greer another philosopher he says that there will come a stage after Bigoy where humanity will try to salvage the waste created by themselves we have have actually reached the bell curve phase but we are still living like we are in the third phase that is the danger of things this is actually why consumption is so much and lack of ecological awareness is that much rampant among us now because we still believe that progress infinite progress is coming our way even though we are living in the year of salvage let's move on and let me tell you how fast fashion harms the planet let's move uh, very quickly through these phases the production phase consumption phase and also the disposal phase in production phase most of the clothing we use today is actually made and uh, they make use of cheap labor available in the world's poorest countries especially uh, Asian countries and because of in areas where these production is made, made um, industrial water pollution happens it is responsible also responsible for 10 percent of carbon emissions in the air one kilogram of cloth that we use it generates 23 kilograms of greenhouse gases and the cost you know the clothes are made in Latin America Syria and Asian countries it has to be transported all around the world so in the age of peak oil crisis this is the cost of transporting products it is also come, coming as a disturbance to the environment so this is the production phase and then we say that you know I am using a, a sustainable clothing products like cotton how can it uh, how can it hurt the ecosystem or ecology Dana Thomas, uh, she's an author, she says in her book Fashionopolis that conventionally grown cotton is one of agriculture's most polluting crops. Almost one kilogram of hazardous pesticides is required to grow one hectare of fluff in one jacket. So in one jacket that you use, the kind of, you know, the one in one kilogram of cotton, you need um, a lot of pesticides to grow that amount of uh, cotton and also in the production phase of cotton we have to dye it and we have to process it we are using a lot of chemical agents petroleum resources and energy It'll, it is actually poisoning the earth and ground water by, while decomposing these these chemical agents anyway and let's see in one cotton t-shirt that you use one third of a pound of lab made fertilizers are used to 25.3 kilowatts of energy is used uh, to make one cotton t-shirt and 2700 liters of water to grow that much cotton now you can't say that we are eco uh, ecologically sustainable fashion users right and when it comes to synthetic fabrics it's even worse synthetic fabrics like polyester spandex nylon uh, it uh, use almost 342 million barrels of oil just for production like on a jacket a jacket is actually synthetically made it's actually made of uh, especially uh, what comes off as four leather jackets and four leather bags and all uses a lot of it's made of petroleum actually and in the production of uh, clothes like viscose and rayon it's very cheap actually rayon and very comfortable too in how it's made actually hurts it's actually killing the planet it's made from ancient pro, uh, forests felling of trees and using up only about 30 percent of the wood pulp for making the cloth and the rest of the 70 percent is actually turned to sawdust and just burn it they just burn it and also 
they use a lot of chemical processing um, while uh, producing synthetic fabrics like the production of synthetic fabric requires more processed chemicals than cotton and the waste made is always dumped into the rivers in third world countries in which they are produced for example if you can look at this picture it's a very horrifying picture this is uh, the chitaram river in indonesia we can't even see water it's actually full of cloth actually clothes and pollution from uh, the pollutants chemical pollutants from the factories and uh, sweatshops okay and i'm not even mentioning the condition in sweatshops where the, uh, in the name of cheap labor they are just exploiting uh, the people in third world countries um, so not even going into that anyway and uh, again there are certain false eco claims all these brands like H&M, Zara and uh, even our Indian brands claim that they have eco -fri friendly clothing lines for example look at this H&M conscious for a most more sustainable fashion future that's what they are saying here see but uh, it's actually false. All these claims are very false. They have this overblown use of terms like green, eco-friendly, ethical, sustainability, etc. But their products are indeed not as real as they project and market them to be. For example, if you uh, get, a, get a dress, a shirt from uh, H&M Conscious, uh, the tag will say that uh, it's the most sustainable or something like that, made from most sustainable pro products or recycled products or something. But in reality, what is happening is that the only the tag in which it is written is actually made from sustainable product the cloth in itself is actually not sustainable we have to learn to read between lines like this because you can't uh, you can't actually sue them because uh, the tag on which they have written is actually made from uh, sustainable produce right all right and let's move on to the consumption phase now the consumption phase is the most horrible phase because we have an expanding middle class, we have emerging markets, everybody is hungry for cheap fashion. Moreover, the arrival of social networks like Twitter, no, not Twitter, sorry, Instagram, YouTube, etc. You, you see all these online shopping halls, like look at this girl. She has bought all this in one, one day, maybe in one hour she bought all this. And they just exhibit it to the... Um, uh, it online anyway and in Instagram too everybody has to look stylish for the gram so they have this pressure to try uh, to have new and trendy outfits every day and on, a, on an average we buy almost 70 items of clothing per year but we use only 20% of clothing in our wardrobe on a regular basis after wearing clothes three or four times it, it is usually just thrown away so it's very sad state of affairs and then we say, say that Oh, but even though we we buy a lot we are donating so i would like to bust this myth for you i have to introduce this term called the clothing deficit myth clothing deficit myth is it is an idea that the donated clothes to a charity goes to a local community now we don't usually have this uh, concept in uh, western countries in europe and america they have these big bins where you can dump your old clothes and uh, they promise that it will be donated so we are thinking that somewhere in our locality there is a needy person who is getting this but most donated clothes don't reach the needy they are mostly just sold the clothes we are donating for free it is actually sold by these people and only uh, one percent of it is uh, is actually sold on average because uh, it cannot nobody actually needs that and in the u.s 18 tons of donated clothes end up in camps of charities they have these big camps and then it is sold to the highest bidders of secondhand clothes in african countries and some items are stole, uh, sold in the markets of africa and most unusable items are just burned in open spaces and it causes massive air pollution and it mostly ends up in landfills too so just think before you're donating uh, it, it doesn't actually reach the need it, it reaches some kind of a landfill or it is burned or it is sold in African markets okay and uh, I would like to introduce another term to you greenwashing Greenwashing is when certain brands, certain companies market themselves as, as being more green than they really are. Now, H&M 
they launched this program uh, called Recycle Your Clothes program in 2013. Uh, so it encouraged consumers to bring back their used clothes to the outlets and receive an additional 15% discount voucher for their next uh, purchase. So uh, they say that we are, um, uh, we are recycling uh, this. But about recycling, I'll tell you about that later, um, very soon. Anyway, this is actually, the greenwashing actually educates a new trend of consumerism to the new generation. They think that we can just donate our old clothes and get a discount so we can get new clothes. So we f they feel like they're de doing a good deed to the planet, but in reality they are not. Okay, let's come to recycle. Now, certain fast fashion brands claim that the cast of clothes will be recycled by breaking them down into clothing fibers and making new clothes out of them. Now, uh, there is an anti-fast fashion crusader named Elizabeth Klein. She claims that only 1% of cast of clothes ends up, end up recycled in the true sense of the word. Recycling is not always possible because uh, in most of our clothes, we use blended clothes in our garments. It's polyester and cotton. In a, um, like 80% cotton and the rest is spandex. So blended clothes, it's not possible to recycle. Also, when we recycle, the fabric quality is diminished, especially in clothes like cotton and wool. It is also an expensive and time-consuming process. So it is not often possible to recycle clothes. So what happens? The easier way is to dispose your used clothes to third world countries. A majority of donated clothes are shipped to third world countries. And then it is not donated, it is sold actually. The clothes which you are donating get sold for money. So many clothes thus received are of very low quality. It cannot even be sold in third world countries. And vendors have to regularly dump them in landfills or to, or to burn them. So in landfills um, in third world countries, it's a, it's a much cheaper option than recycling clothes, right? So the availability of, availability of low cost uh, secondhand clothes, it also threatens the local textile industry in third world countries too. So let's look at this photo. Uh, this is actually a picture of a second-hand uh, cloth market in Rwanda, in Africa. So it is actually threatening their textile industry uh, in reality. So the major ecological challenges of fast fashion are water pollution during production and disposal, air pollution during production, land pollution through landfills, oil consumption, which I already mentioned, and petroleum usage in processing, transportation, recycling, and disposal. So these are the major, in a nutshell, these are the major ecological challenges. I haven't even started mentioning things about fast fashion anyway. Now, how to tackle this situation? How can we uh, tackle this particular situation? Mainly, your consumption patterns need to change. We have this drive to buy more. It should be cured. And we have this uh, fast fashion business model has this business business model that make more, sell more. It also needs to change. Now there are many reactions against fast fashion, like slow fashion. Now slow fashion is a movement that seeks to promote sustainable innovations, multifunctional and timeless design, reuse of textile materials and services based on alternative strategies such as leasing of fashionable gardens and accessories. Slow fashion. Um, means uh, you know high quality garments are produced in uh, small limited batches using regional producing production and regional resources environmentally preferable fibers are used as much as possible anyway but unfortunately the problem with so slow fashion garments is it is very expensive it is not affordable there are certain uh, slow fashion um, brands in india they use ecologically sustainable material and all uh, for example, No Nasties, Upasana, Kasha, uh, Doodlech. I looked up Doodlech. I really wanted to buy Doodlech. But for a plain, simple kurti like the one I'm wearing now, it costs 5,000 rupees. So it's not affordable to everybody. So slow fashion, it could be ethical. It is eco fashion. It is also lasting, but it is very expensive. So uh, again, uh, there are certain other methods in which we can tackle this situation. There are some small scale phenomena like, you know, fashion libraries. Uh, just like you can uh, loan a book from a library, you can actually uh, loan some clothes from certain shops you know, on rent. That's actually good. 
you know, every day uh, you end up wearing different clothes. You don't even have to um, harm the planet for that. And then there are clothing swaps. You can swap clothes with another person. You can refashion. You can use your old sari to make a new salwar. Then clothing repair services are also really nice. Then you can shop at, shop at thrift stores. So look at these two um, outlets. Rent the runway is a, uh, is a cloth renting service. And this is Patagonia where a, a person is seen to be... Um, mending clothes so if uh, your old clothes has suffered some damage you only need to take it there they'll it's not a tailoring service they make it like brand new so um, another method is you can just continue our indian custom of hand-me-down garments you can reuse ruined clothes for other household needs and indians are best in this regard we have a good cloth we use it for a long time after that we use it in the house uh, use it for sleeping after that we use it for uh, like cleaning and uh, when it becomes thread there only we even then we use it for something we have that kind of a salvage mentality and the best thing of all is if you can be fashionable and yet you know not harm the ecosystem for it it needs to be ethical fashion needs to be democratic and affordable so how is this relevant to a student of English, um, or of literature? First of all, I have a word for all the teachers listening to this. We all have to teach EVS. Even though we are English teachers, we are teaching environmental science. Uh, the idea is, you know, we should teach our uh, students to read uh, between the lines learn that subtle act of art of reading between the lines there are certain huge claims made by these fashion brands we have to teach our students uh, to read between the lines and get an understanding they have to learn this art of uh, literary and linguistic investigation and they also have to cherish a spirit of ecological inquiry whenever they consume something and whenever they are they become consumers in one regard or the other they should actually inquire whether this is harming the ecosystem in any regard if you do that actually if you incorporate fashion because we are dealing with students from an age group of 18 to 22 in this age group the girls especially they are drawn into fashionable things and if you incorporate fashion into EVS, uh, especially if you juxtapose models of local and global brands, EVS can be made very interesting by being related to their everyday life. So I uh, hope that my presentation brought some kind of uh, insight uh, regarding fashion model. Uh, once again, I would like to thank everybody who gave me this opportunity. Um, and I would like to collaborate with your institution in future. Thanks once again. Thank you.